The proper way to operate the speed controller is to keep an eye on the propulsion loop current. Don't hesitate. The bridge wants its orders carried out at once, but never turn the speed controller fast enough to send the propulsion loop current over its rated value. Fast turning overloads the propulsion machinery. It does not give faster response because power must be supplied gradually as the ship gains speed. The propeller cannot use a sudden increase in power. Short circuit protection. The short circuit relay opens the main field contactors and removes field from both the generators and motors. This relay works when a short circuit or some other fault gives that which the current limiting devices cannot control. When the short circuit relay works, the amber light flashes on. Look at the loop ammeter and turn the speed controller to off. Don't leave it there. Immediately move the speed controller slowly, watching the loop ammeter. If the current is small, keep moving the speed controller to give the required RPM. Perhaps it was not a short circuit, but a shock or vibration which jarred some contactor and removed the field. Whenever the main field contactors are opened, the speed controller must be returned to off to reset the protective equipment. Until this is done, field cannot be applied to the motors and generators. Now let's go back to where the speed controller is turned to off and then ahead. If the amber light comes on again, it indicates a short circuit or other serious trouble. Pull out the main field cutout switch and remove the generators from the propulsion loop. Notify the bridge and the engineer officer and start looking for the trouble. Engine fault relay. The engine fault relay is a protective device which operates when two generators are being used in the propulsion loop and one engine fails. When running on two generators, both generator transfer switches will be at propulsion. Both red indicating lights will be out showing that the generator field contactors are closed. And both engines will be running at the same speed. If engine number three fails and is unable to carry its load, the speed drops. The engine fault relay opens the field circuit of the generator to keep the engine from being driven backward by its generator. The red indicating lamp for number three generator lights to show that its field contactors have been opened. When this happens, take the generator out of the propulsion loop. Turn the speed controller to point 11. The generator transfer switch to bypass. The individual governor control cutout switch to off. and the motor field controller to the Mark IV-1 generator operation. Adjust the speed with the speed controller. And push the reset push button for the engine fault relay. This must be done or the generator will not deliver power when its engine is running. Always notify the bridge and the engineer officer when any casualty occurs. When the engine is ready to carry its load, cut the generator back in again. Speed controller to 11. Motor field controller at two, governor cutout switch, 
transfer switch, and speed controller to bring up to the required speed. Generator field emergency trip switch. The generator field emergency trip switch is a manually operated safety device located in the after engine room near the throttle position. If engine trouble develops, the motor machinist mate can take control with the hand throttle and push the switch from ready to trip position. This opens the field of the generator and removes the load on the engine and causes the red indicating light on the control board in the after motor room to light. The control man removes the generator from the propulsion loop in the same manner as when the engine fault relay operates. Engine fails. If the engine fails when using only one generator and one engine for propulsion, the engine fault relay will not operate. At the control board, the first visible sign of trouble is a drop in shaft RPM. The dropping engine revolutions show that the trouble is an engine failure. When only one engine is in use and it fails, turn the speed controller all the way to off. Next, pull out the main field cutout switch. Turn the generator transfer switch and the governor control cutout switch to off. Signal engine number four to stop and number three to run. Notify the bridge and the engineer officer that the engine has failed. Propeller drag turns the shaft and motors as long as the ship is making headway on the other screw. And when the motors turn, they circulate current through the propulsion loop. The generator stops with the engine, and current flowing through the stationary commutator may burn the bars. That's why the generator should always be cut out of the propulsion loop when its engine fails. When the engine room gets an engine started, its generator can be cut back into the propulsion loop. Check the motor field controller to see that it is at the mark for one generator operation. Turn the individual governor control cutout switch to on, and the generator transfer switch to propulsion. Push in the main field cutout switch and turn the speed controller to bring the propeller speed up to the required RPM. A generator is now back in again, delivering power to turn the port propeller shaft. Generator field contactors fail to close. If the generator field contactor fails to close, the indicating light stays lit when the generator transfer switch is turned from bypass to propulsion. First, push in the reset push button for the engine fault relay. If this is the trouble, the light goes out. Or sometimes the light stays on even after the reset push button has been pressed. Call the after engine room. If they have left the generator field emergency trip switch in the trip position, the generator field contactors will not close. Have them push it to the ready position. This should close the generator field contactor at the control board and cause the light to go off.
local propulsion auxiliaries fail to start. If a local propulsion auxiliary such as a lubricating oil pump fails to start when the starter button is pushed, it will be apparent because the sound of the motor will not be heard. There's something wrong. The absence of sound will also tell when a salt water circulating pump fails to start. Again, something is wrong. It's probably in the power supply. If the local exciter fails to start when the exciter transfer switch is turned to local, the lights will not come on. Excitation must be made available, so turn the transfer switch to standby. The lights will then come on. In all three cases, check the power panel on the port side, which supplies power to a lubricating oil pump, a salt water circulating pump, and the local exciter. The switches to the local propulsion auxiliaries are off. Turn them on. This should have been checked while preparing to get underway and before attempting to start the local propulsion auxiliaries. Now here's another condition. Both power indicating lights are out. The power panel is getting no power and naturally can supply none to the local propulsion auxiliaries. Call the ship service switchboards and get power to the power panels. This should have been checked while preparing to get underway. Or here's still another condition. Only one indicating light is lit, showing the standby power is available. The bus transfer switch at the bottom of the panel is set at normal. Shift it to standby. In all of these cases, the local propulsion auxiliaries could not start because they were not supplied with power. Make similar checks at the power panel on the starboard side. This supplies power to the other lubricating oil pump and to the other salt water circulating pump. Get the power to the auxiliaries and they will almost always go. If they do not, use the standby equipment and look for the trouble. Standby exciter fails to start. The standby exciter will not start from the after control board when only the forward ship service generator is being used to supply power. If you want to use the standby exciter for the after control board under these conditions, put the exciter transfer switch to standby. Exciter and its control cabinet are located. Have the electrician start the standby exciter manually. The electrician pulls one manual starting lever, and if the motor generator set does not start, returns it to off, then pulls the other starting lever. Never pull one lever while the other is on. This will jam and perhaps break the interlock. Also check the isolating switches on the control cabinet to make sure they are both on. Be sure that the exciter transfer switch is turned to standby before the set is started manually. When started, the control bus voltage goes to 120 volts and the light comes on. But if the exciter set is started with the exciter transfer switch at off, a magnetic interlock keeps the transfer switch from being turned to standby. Lubricating oil pressure. When the lubricating oil pressure to the motor fails, the low pressure alarm is activated. The oiler must immediately start the other lubricating oil pump to restore oil pressure. If neither one of the two lubricating oil pumps will start and restore the lubricating oil pressure,
the control man must notify the bridge that lubricating oil pressure has been lost and it will be necessary to stop the motors. Propulsion motor failed. In case the fire breaks out in a propulsion motor, the flow of current through the motor should be stopped at once. The control man should immediately turn the speed controller to off and take the generators out of the propulsion loop. For a fire in the motor, stop the current first and then turn carbon dioxide into the motor to put out the fire. The bridge and the engineer officer should be notified immediately. Prompt action is needed for fires or serious trouble. If motor number three is too badly damaged for use, it must be cut out of the propulsion loop so that number four motor can be used to turn the shaft. Be absolutely sure that the control board is dead before touching anything inside the grating. A damaged motor is disconnected by unbolting and shifting the motor disconnect link. These are short, heavy strips of copper running vertically from the bus bars in the control board to the motor lead. One set to the positive, and one set to the negative lead. Both must be taken off to cut out motor number three. Its links are toward the back of the board. Motor number four links are toward the front. Since number three is the damaged motor, its links are the ones to be unbolted and shifted. Connect one set of links horizontally between the upper pair of bus bars. Do not connect the lower set across the motor leads. This would short the armature. Then disconnect the motor field leads to the damaged motor. It will turn with the other motor, and if field is left on, will act as a generator. This could send current through insulation damaged by fire. Tape the ends of the field leads removed from the terminal board so that they cannot cause the short circuit. Only one motor is now connected in the propulsion loop so that only one generator should be used for propulsion. Now here is another important step. Set the motor field controller a little beyond the mark for two generator operations. One motor running on one generator requires more field for the motor than two motors running on two generators. Proceed with one generator supplying power to the undamaged motor on the port shaft. While you have been shown what to do in case of trouble, remember that trouble is the exception, not the rule. The power plant which drives this diesel-electric destroyer escort is rugged and reliable. It provides for great flexibility of operation. Part of the propulsion equipment can be shut down completely while the rest is used to drive the ship when cruising or convoying at less than full speed. All of the equipment is used to give full speed and power for attack on Axis submarines.